We're going to turn our eyes now towards uh, the Word of God. And I'm going to invite you to uh, open our Bibles together to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. It's going to be the teaching for the English message tonight. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, says the following. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Shortly after... Jesus starts his Sermon on the Mount, which we identify in Matthew chapter 5. In verses 1 through 9 or 10, I believe, uh, he lists the Beatitudes. But immediately following that, he compares and he associates Christians or those who are Christ-like with two elements, one being the salt of the earth, and second, he calls them the light of the world. And I quote Matthew 5, 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, the light, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all whom are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The intention of tonight's message is a multiple one because it's a passage that is often misunderstood, misquoted, and misused. Misunderstood simply because if taken out of context and used by itself, particularly verse 12, can create problems. Misused because religions of the world today use it and say, see, it is not enough what Jesus has done on the cross. Paul himself says that you got to work out your own salvation. I won't name them, but if you want to research, you can. And misinterpreted because it is chosen to justify certain positions. And because it's a message mainly geared towards youth. I'll remind to those of you who are going through the baptism preparation class. And I'll remind to those of you, I'll remind you those who have been through it, that at the end of chapter 1, there's a question that says and states the following, is there anything else that can be done to complete our salvation? And the simple and direct answer to that is no. When Christ himself said, it is finished. 
at that time, our salvation has been made complete. And what I want to do tonight with you is something that I've never done at Agape or that I don't remember doing at Agape yet. Is to interpret this passage in light of the book that is written in only. Meaning... The text that we're going to use to help explain this passage and its teaching is going to be out of Philippians and Philippians only. Because one of the rules and the main rule of interpreting and reading the Word of God is that the Word of God completes itself and interprets itself. It never contradicts, right? We know that for a fact. And what I try and and what I pray that we're going to get out of this is two things. One, the desire to look in the Word of God deeper. And two, the desire to look in the Word of God correctly. And thus, what we're going to do, we're going to place this text in the context in which Paul uses it. And we're going to look and try to understand its meaning and its teaching. I simply entitled tonight's message, The Life Whose Light Shines Bright. I didn't intend it to rhyme, but I guess it does. And that's simply because in verse 15, Paul ends that verse and he says, Amongst whom you shine as lights in the world. And what I want to do is look at three things and three principles that are necessary in order for one's life to shine bright in the world around us. And first and foremost, a life whose light shines bright is a life that remains constantly obedient by relying on God to work in it. Let's read verse 12 and 13 one more time. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Every time we see the word therefore, we ought to look automatically what precedes that. And what precedes that in verse 5 to 11 is the ultimate example of obedience described by Paul in Jesus Christ himself. In verse 8, he concludes and he says, And being found in appearance as men, he humbled himself and became obedient To the point of death. I love what Paul does here and the way he expresses himself and writes to the Philippians. Which by the way in many ways is considered one of the better position churches that he established. He simply says, therefore my beloved as you always obeyed, not as in my presence only... But now much more in my absence. This brings us to the very first point, And that is that obedience is not tied and should not be tied to location or to company. You see, it's easy to be obedient here, right? It's easy youth to be obedient possibly Tuesday night because Paul's around you and he sees you. It's easy to be obedient in church because the pastors are around and others can't see me, right? You know where our obedience is defined? Our complete obedience is defined in our own room where we're by ourselves. Which voice do I obey at that time? Which choice do I value at that time? Which decision do I consider of importance at that time? The decision to be obedient 
or the decision to fulfill my own pleasures. Paul says, as you have been obedient, not only in my presence, but now that I am not with you. He says, continue to be obedient. It's not only that I'm with you, Christians in Philippi, that you have to be obedient. No, he says, even in my absence, continue to be obedient. And brothers and sisters, I submit to you that if we desire to have our lives shining bright in the world around us, it starts with obedient and complete obedience to the word of God. Second thing that flows from this, he says, work out. And here's where we can encounter our problem. Work out does not mean do your own good deeds because you are good and you can do good. No. Work out translated from Greek, what it means, it means that you are to focus to see something through. Make sense? When he says work out your salvation, it means focus to see your salvation through or attend to do the things that you, ought to, that you are called to do to fulfill or, or to complete, to see your salvation to its completion. Philippians 3.12 to 14, Paul says the following, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. I don't lose focus of what's ahead of me. I don't lose focus of the calling that God has given me. I don't lose focus of the salvation that Christ has brought me. And I live in such a way in which I completely desire to see that through. You see, it's easy a lot of times to lose focus of that. And to be preoccupied and overwhelmed by other things. But the word of God tonight reminds us that we ought to be focused on those things that will see us through to the end and completion of our salvation. And he says, do that. Be obedient. Focus on the things that will see you through to the salvation that was brought to you in fear and trembling. Again, the translation that he uses here is simply respect and reverence. Philippians 1, 27, 28, he writes and he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one Spirit. We preached about this and we touched upon this before. But our God is a holy God who demands and expect, expects reverence. I think a lot of times we don't realize that. I think a lot of times we don't ponder on the holiness of God and of what that means and what it's supposed to mean for our lives. And we lose sight of that. And I pray that the word of God will remind us through the Holy Spirit tonight that as Christians and as the Christians in Philippi were called to be obedient not, when only, not only when Paul was with them, but even in his absence, we ought to be obedient every moment of our lives. We ought to submit ourselves to God constantly. It doesn't come naturally. But it's something that we ought to decide. And we ought to say, I do it. And I train myself into doing it daily. I read an interesting example. I don't know a lot about animals and, and, and particularly horses. I think Eddie can teach me a whole lot more 
in regards to that. But I heard of a breed called Arabian horses. I heard that they're pretty sought after. And I heard that they're trained by master trainers in the deserts, in the Middle Eastern deserts. And they're trained to the point that they got to be obedient as soon as they hear the whistle of the trainer. And one way in which they're doing that is that they starve the horses of water for days on end. And as they go through those days, they then take them close to a pond of water and they let them go free. And as they get closer and closer to that pond of water, the trainer watches. And when they get to the very tip of that pond, he blows the whistle. And the hardest thing for that horse to do is to make a U-turn and come, come back around to its trainer. But it is said that only those who do that and come back are selected to be put aside and, and truly valued. Guess what happens when they come back? The trainer gives them as much water as they need and they want to drink. They gave up on that. Through obedience and submission to that trainer. And they came back. And they received a lot more than what they could have had out of that pond. You see, we ought to train ourselves to live in complete obedience to the word of God. Second, a life whose light will shine brightly is a life that resists complaining and resorts to always allow God's work to shine through it. Verses 14 through 16, first part, tells us that. He says, do all things without complaining and disputing. And you may say, well, it's easy, right? Well, it's easy when you do what you like to do, but it's not easy when you have to do what you don't like to do. And the first instinct is to complain. Why am I not the one who does that? Or why am I not the one who does this? Why am I the one who always has to do a certain thing and nobody else does, right? And Paul says to the Philippians, do all things without complaining. And this brings us to the next point, to the first point of uh, of the second uh, idea, that is that attitude is not and should not be dependent on tasks. The attitude with, with which we do things and serve God should not be dependent on the tasks that are ahead of us. Philippians 2, 1 through 3, he says... Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in, loveliness, in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. I want to remind you of the message this morning. Part of it tied into this. The attitude with which we serve God and we do the things of God will determine how bright our life will shine as a light in the world around us. And second... That attitude and that approach brings me closer to the source of light. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, Paul writes and says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
How do you think that our serving can bring praise of God if it's not done in love and with the correct approach and the correct attitude? How do you think that our lives outside of this church and outside of these walls will be a light that shines bright, bringing glory to God, if the things that we do in our daily lives are not done like being done for, the, for, 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 for God and for the glory of God? I believe that it's time for us to be reminded of these basic things. That we ought to live our lives amongst a generation that, that Paul defines as, as, as crooked and perverse. We ought to live our lives as lights that shine brightly for God and for who he is. I read, prepping for this, a study about light and the dark. And it is being said that if you're somewhere on a hilltop and you can see in a valley ahead of you, you can distinguish the headlights of a car at a distance of about two miles. You can pinpoint and say those are two distinctive headlights, two independent headlights. But from the same position higher, if you were to have clearance and see to the horizon, what do you think the distance of a candlelight ahead of you in pitch dark, what do you think the distance that you can see that candlelight burning is? Have any idea? 30 miles. Pitch dark on a hilltop with horizon in front of you. The light that emanates from a burning candle can be seen 30 miles away. I didn't say that. If the study is not correct, then I'm wrong. But the Boston, one of the Boston universities that did the study concluded that. In a dark and pitch dark world, how bright do you think our lives should shine? How much light do you think that we are called to bring in today's world? Hopeless world, if I may say. But we can only do that if we resist complaining. And if we truly resort to always allow God to work in us and through us. And his works to be seen. Third and last, and I'm going to conclude. A life whose light shines bright. As a life that rejoices in the company and presence of those whom always labor to further God's work. I found it interesting when Paul writes and he says... So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, he says, you also be glad and rejoice with me. And this brings us to the point and the question of what are the places and things that bring joy to our lives? What are the places and, and things that bring true joy to our lives? I'm not talking about enjoying a good meal. We all do that. But I'm talking about that joy that resides in our hearts. That radiates from our faces. And that is seen from those around us. Regardless of the circumstances. 
true joyfulness should not be hindered by circumstances, brothers and sisters, youth. I'm talking about that true internal joy. Found it interesting when Paul writes in chapter 1 again. And he says in verses 19 through 26, simply, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live, on the fl- if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, th- yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard pressed. But he says in 25, being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Do you know the circumstances that Paul writes this letter in? We would think that he'd be free to roam around and go wherever he chooses and he wants, right? But he writes this letter being in prison. Yet his joy is not hindered or determined by that. The true joy of knowing Christ and benefiting salvation, brothers and sisters, should not be hindered by circumstances. Yes, we go through trials. Yes, we go through tough times. I, I, we see that. But the joy that's above all and it should be above all is the joy of knowing Christ as Lord and Savior. The joy that one day we will be together with him for eternity. And we'll spend it in his presence. That should fill our hearts. And allow our lights to shine brightly. And that joy is contagious amongst God's children. Philippians 3, 25 through 30. Philippians 2, 25 through 30. He expresses that. That joy of which is contagious amongst those who serve Christ. And he says, even you with me in, in, in the last verse that we read. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. When you're in the company of those who seek God when you're in the company of those who see God's presence that brings and produces the true joy of our lives my prayer for us as Christians in this world and for this generation is that we would be just like the Philippians back then that we would live our lives in such a way in which we would bring glory to God in which we would, we would, in which we would present a different way of living, a different standard with different values, in such a way in which those people that live around us and see us day in day out would desire to have the same way of life, and that not for our own recognition, that not for our own benefit but for the glory of God, as Paul says. And to that I say, so help us, God, each and every day of our lives. Amen. We're going to go over the announcements. Um.